treatment of leukemia, we do chemotherapy in four stages. They'll start out with induction therapy, and the goal with this is to get the child into remission or at least get them to where there's less than 5% leukemic cells in the bone marrow. That's followed by CNS prophylactic therapy and then intensification therapy, which is also consolidation therapy. And this is an attempt to eradicate those last leukemic cells. So the last hard ones to get rid of. Uh, we're trying to get rid of here and then we go to a maintenance therapy and the goal with that we're hoping to keep this child in remission to just maintain remission if they do relapse then we go back to a reinduction uh, therapy and at some point we may need to do a bone marrow transplant uh, this is where we take um, the stem cells from somebody else's bone marrow and give them to the child hoping that those new cells will settle into the child's bone marrow and take over, proliferate, and produce normal healthy cells, blood cells. Here's a picture. Um, doctors, and particularly the oncologist, not just any old doc, uh, will do the bone marrow aspirates, but they usually have somebody helping them. We'll put emla cream to numb the site on um, half an hour to an hour beforehand. You put the cream on, cover it with a tegaderm to keep it in place, and it uh, numbs the site. Depending on the child and how old they are and how cooperative they are, we may also need to sedate them. And then the surgeon, or I mean the, the oncologist, uh, puts on sterile gloves and sterilely injects the needle through the bone into the marrow and draws some up. And you know if a child's not um, responding or they're relapsing they may have to do hemopoietic stem cell transplantation. So they um, take the hemopoietic, so um, producing new cells, new blood cells, that those stem cells from someone else who's a, a match and give those to the child. Now kids with ALL because we have pretty good results that's not recommended during their first remission. If they relapse then they'll start talking about doing a transplant um, but not during the first re remission. With AML um, the hemopoietic stem cell transplant is probably going to be considered at the very first remission because that is um, a harder uh, leukemia to, to, to cure. The problem with the, doing the stem cell transplant is this is really our last um, choice so we don't want to use up all of our options too quickly if we don't have to, and that's why they'll wait on the ALL, but not necessarily on the AML. Now, nursing considerations. A child with leukemia, there's a lot of pain going on. It's that marrow pain, it's deep pain, it's hard to control. So we want to make sure we're really working on controlling pain. Remember, they're at risk for infection. First, they didn't have enough mature white blood cells and now we've killed off what they do have. So they're very at risk for infection. And we'll look at how to calculate an ANC in a minute. They're also at risk for hemorrhage because, again, we've killed off. They, they started out low because of the over -peripheration, peripheration of the immature white cells. And now we've killed off what they did have, what they were producing, so low platelets. Anemia, same thing with our red cells. And on the chemo, we need to manage the th symptoms, nausea and vomiting, anorexia. Um, they'll get sores in their mouth that can be very painful. At children's, they have a rinse. Um, they call it magic mouthwash, actually. And the goal is to numb their mouth so those sores don't hurt, and they try and order it before meals. So hopefully if we can numb those sores, then they can eat without pain. 
neuropathy, which is nerve pain, hemorrhagic cystitis, that's painful voiding with some blood in the urine, alopecia, losing your hair, and when we give them steroids, which we do, some of the side effects are moon face and mood changes. Now, calculating an ANC. This is the absolute neutrophil count. So we're going to decide or count up how many neutrophils they have. These, depending on how your lab reports it, are either polys or SEGs. They're the polynucleated um, cells or segmented cells and also stabs or bands, which are your newer cells um, being produced. And we're going to multiply those because those are our effective uh, infection fighters. Multiply those by the total number of white blood cells that we have. So, for example, if on our differential we had 7% neutrophils and 7% bands and a total white count of 1,000, we would take that 7% and 7%, that should be pluses, not equals, 7% um, plus 7% equals 14%. Remember that's a percent, so we want to change it to a decimal. As a decimal, it's 0 0.14, because percent means it's out of 100. We multiply that 0 0.14 times our total white count, which was 1,000. So our ANC, our absolute neutrophil count, is 140. Here's a really old fangled lab page. Now it's all electronic, so it doesn't look anything like this. But if you look at the top there, our total white count is 5.8 down there below where the lines get thinner we have SEGs of 35 and STABs of 10. So again you add up your SEGs and your STABs and multiply them by the total white count and that is how you get your ANC. Do expect uh, to calculate an ANC on the exam. So we're giving very toxic drugs to these kids. That's part of the point. We're trying to kill off the abnormal um, cells and the bone marrow that's producing abnormal cells, so the abnormal bone marrow. So the other things we're going to kill off any cells that rapidly uh, m um, reproduce, which is your whole GI system. So we get nausea and vomiting and anorexia and those sores in the mouth. We get neuropathy, pain on the nerves, um, the bladder, the hemorrhagic cystitis, we kill off the hair. It does grow back after they stop chemotherapy, but they'll have they'll lose their hair. They'll get moon, mood changes and moon face from the uh, steroids that we put them on. One other thing to think about: these kids are really prone to um, sunburn, so. They've lost their hair and we want to keep sun off their heads. So they need to wear hats or head coverings. Um, adults almost always, they wear wigs that, or they'll offer them wigs at least. Kids, it seems like they're pretty comfortable um, with not having hair, but we do want to make sure that they're protected from the sun. Now looking at the um, cancers of our lymph system, we have Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So looking first at Hodgkin's disease, this is asymptomatic enlarged lymph adenopathy. So the symptoms are fever, weight loss, night sweats, abdominal pain, anorexia, nausea, and puritis, itching. Kind of fairly um, nondescript, right? So they diagnose this by doing a lymph node biopsy it's treated with radiation and with chemotherapy. This has um, quite good survival rates in the early stage, 90% if it's early. If it gets to an advanced stage, then we're looking at 65 to 75% survival rates. And our body, we have lymph nodes all over. I mean, our whole body is full of lymph nodes where we're really going to, and then some other lymphatic tissues um, like our tonsils and then we have the cervical lymph nodes, liver and spleen are lymph um, tissues, and you can see lymph nodes under the, the armpits, the axillary nodes, along the aorta and down the mesentery. Those are all um, ones that are 
uh, can be frequently um, affected. Now in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's widespread and it's disseminated, not limited to a, a specific group of nodes. Um, will aggressively use a radiation and chemotherapy and the prognosis is very good if we had localized disease. Uh, so relapsing with this after two years is rare. If you're going to relapse, it's going to be pretty early. HIV. Um, HIV is not significantly different than adults. It's still from the HIV virus and those symptoms classified together we call AIDS. Only 1% of our AIDS cases in the U.S. are kids. And of those, 90% of them acquired it during birth um, from the mother. We do have some medications now that we can help to reduce that transmission during birth. When That's when mom and baby are most likely to be exposed to each other's blood. So uh, with the new treatments, we only had 101 cases um, of perinatally acquired AIDS in 2001. And our goals for a kid are pretty much the same as with an adult. We want to slow the growth of the virus. We want to prevent those opportunistic infections that they get because they don't have a, a good immune system because that's what the AIDS is um, affecting. It's human immunovirus. Uh, and then we want to make sure we're providing adequate nutritional support and symptom management. The one thing that kids are very prone to is the CNS complications. They can develop um, encephalopathy where I mean, they become extremely delayed, stiff, um, sort of like, you know, very severe CP and uh, that happens more easily in children. I mean, it's a complication with adults, but you see it more in, in, as a complication in kids who get HIV. And then blood reactions. If we give blood to a child, we have to watch for reactions. Blood reactions can be life-threatening. Our most severe is a hemolytic reaction. And hemolyzing, meaning breaking, um, all their red blood cells start breaking apart. They'll have chills, shaking, sudden spike in fever, and um, if you have a Foley in, you will see that urine turn from yellow to pink red. I mean, they just dump out blood. Obviously, that's life threatening. We've got to stop the infusion. We don't want to give them any more of that blood, but we've got to get fluids in them to keep some volume um, while we try and get every get them um, stable. Other reactions, a febrile reaction or an allergic reaction can happen. Um, circulatory overload. This is fluid. I mean they may not be able to handle what we're giving them. So we usually with kids will try and give just what's needed. We may give fresh frozen plasma or we may give packed red blood cells as opposed to whole blood an air emboli, particularly if we're trying to infuse blood fast and we put it under a pressure bag, you're at risk for pushing in air. Um, and that's, an air emboli is going to be, they're going to have difficulty breathing fairly suddenly, pain in the chest. And then hypothermia, usually we try and warm blood before we give it, and they do have blood warmers that you can run it through as you're giving it, um, so that we don't give them hypothermia. Electrolytes and particularly we're looking at potassium, hyperkalemia, and hypocalcemia, the citrate intoxication.